Good morning. Good morning. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Uh, I'm Terry Stewart, and I'm one of the sexual assault nurses at Harborview, and along with Cheryl Graff, coordinate the same training across the state of Washington. We're going to do a presentation today about the sexual assault exam and hope that we can increase everyone's knowledge about what it includes. And I just want to clarify that our talk is really going to be specific to practices in Washington State. Um, generally, exams are fairly similar across the country, although different areas do things a little bit differently. So you may hear of things that we're doing that look different than what may be happening in other states. But for this purpose of our exam, we're just or of our talk today, we're just going to focus on mostly Washington State issues. So as we move forward, um, the first thing that I wanted to uh, touch on is the role of the sexual assault nurse. Um, the primary job of the sexual assault nurse is first and foremost to provide competent medical care to the patient that presents for the exam. Uh, we also collect forensic evidence as the patient desires that may or may not be used in uh, legal proceedings. We provide the patient with prophylactic medications to protect against sexually transmitted infections and pregnancy. We document all of the injuries, and both photographically and on a paper traumagram. We educate patients about their legal options and choices regarding reporting and the legal case and how things are going to move forward. And then we uh, assist the patient in assessing their safety at discharge, finding appropriate discharge resources. We plan for their follow-up needs, which may be medical, may be counseling, may be advocacy needs. And we collaborate with all the other members of the team. And that includes the advocates, it includes law enforcement, prosecutors, and it even includes defense attorneys. So we all work together to support people who have been sexually assaulted. And one of the Terry, I think what's unique about particularly our state is this model has been very successful for the last two decades. And ideally, we advocate for our trainings that the nurses primarily in the emergency department, because this is where patients will present themselves most likely, that the patient is getting one-on-one -on -one care from that sexual assault nurse examiner and getting the time that they need, because these can be very lengthy proceedings for a patient to go through the whole examination process. So we are strongly advocating with the advocate and the nurse to have the one-on-one -on -one time needed for that particular patient. One of the things that sexual assault nurses do not do is make a determination if a sexual assault has actually occurred. We don't really have the ability to make that determination. Our role is not to decide if there's guilt or innocence or truth or lies. We are really there as a neutral party providing medical care and collecting forensic evidence. And sometimes this can be difficult for patients to understand and for advocates to understand. Patients often really want to know if they were raped or if they were drugged, but we can't always answer those questions. Most sexual assault patients never have genital injuries that would say yes or no, they were definitely raped. Many patients who have consensual sex can also have injuries. So the presence or absence of injuries doesn't really tell us anything. We make a report based on what the patient says, and we Basically, as sexual assault nurses, we go from that starting point of believing the patient and documenting what they say. Questions always come up about, was I drugged? Are you going to do testing for drugging? And we can easily do testing for drugging, but all of those tests go to the Washington State Toxicology Lab, which runs the tests. And the sexual assault nurse in the emergency room doesn't get those results typically ever, but certainly not in the course of the exam. So this is an area that can be really a challenge for patients is not having all the answers when they leave the emergency room. But just because they don't have all the answers at that point doesn't mean that we're not encouraging them to go forward with legal process, to think about what's going to work best for them. We give them the information that we have at that moment, but we do need to remain neutral in the care of that patient. The first thing that happens typically in the sexual assault exam is an interview of the patient. We take a detailed history of events to find out exactly what happened and what brought the patient into the emergency room. What do they remember or don't remember? Uh, we write down the history as they report it to us, typically in near verbatim uh, fashion. 
And then we follow up with some very specific questions that we ask to help us guide our exam. So have they already made a police report and who have they made it to? Which jurisdiction should we anticipate contacting us to collect the evidence? Were there threats? Was the patient restrained? Were they hit, kicked, thrown, strangled, bitten, any other types of force? All of those are going to clue us in to areas there may be injuries we need to document, areas there may be evidence we need to swab for. If there were impaired consciousness or any episode of amnesia, do we need to collect forensic toxicology? Do we need to look a little further into their medical history about why those things may have occurred? We do ask patients about their recent substance use, and we're not asking them as a way of placing blame on a patient, but the amount of substance that a patient may have used does go toward the issue of were they able to give consent. Um, it may also go toward was there some substance in the, found in the patient's blood or urine that they did not willingly take. So we will ask them very specifically about their substance use. And really, prosecutors tell us that the more they know up front about patients, that the more that they can also work with that within the building of the case. It's when surprises come up that makes it difficult for prosecutors to move forward. We ask patients about the specific nature of the contact that occurred between them and the assailant. And very clearly and document, did a penis go into a vagina? Did it go into an anus? Did it go into a mouth? All of this is telling us where should we anticipate collecting evidence? Where might there be evidence that we can get? Was a condom used? That may change the evidence. Was there ejaculation? Did it occur outside of the vagina or outside of the anus? Is it on another part of the body that we can collect additional swabbing? And then we also ask whether they know anything about the HIV risk of the assailant. Most patients don't know, and that's okay. They don't need to know. We can still do a risk assessment and plan for medications. But if they do know, that helps us a little bit more to figure out how best to support that patient. And then we ask, what did the patient do after the assault occurred? Did they bathe or shower? Have they gone to the bathroom? Have they rinsed their mouth or ate or drank? Some of those activities may change the evidence that we can collect. Where is their clothing? Is it at home that we need to send the police to their house to get it? Do they bring it with them? Do they have it in another location? Again, information that we need in order to do the exam and collect the evidence. And then the last part is this what we call a general review of systems, where we ask the patient about how they're feeling right now medically. Do they have injuries they've noticed? Are they having any pain anywhere? We go through different parts of the body so that we can be clear about what we really need to be, be aware of on our exam. One of the other things as we are taking that detailed history as sexual assault nurse examiners, we're also listen, listening to the patient related to where they're at in their process. So, for example, if I was assaulted and I had been drinking tonight, I may have tremendous guilt about my choices that I made tonight. Poor choices do not entitle someone to rape the patient. So it's important that we're also listening because I may need to do some normalization for that patient. I may also have to help that patient talk about how they're feeling, the crisis that they're in, and help them have some ability to talk about where they're at today, particularly with teenagers. We see a lot of teenagers who don't necessarily make the best choices. They want to know if they're like everyone else, and they want to be renormalized. So we spend time listening to find out how we can assist the patient. One of the other purposes of the interview really is, like I said, to guide the exam and the evidence collection. And it, a lot of the questions do feel very intrusive to patients, but we are only asking questions that we know are important for our exam and our evidence collection, and also for us to maintain the safety of the patient. So when we're asking about the assault history, when we're asking about their medical history and any other needs they may have that night, are they suicidal? What's their family history? All of that matters to us so that we can understand how to best care for that patient in that moment. After the interview, we do move on to the exam. The patient is the person that guides the exam. They have the right to accept or decline any portion of the exam. And just because they come to an emergency room and ask for a sexual assault exam doesn't mean that we're forcing every single part of that exam on them. 
We talk about what's involved in the exam. We ask them what they'd like us to do. And then oftentimes in the middle of the exam, patients may change their mind or we may need to reassess where they're at. And so it's a constant looking and talking with patients and making sure that what we're doing is okay with them. One thing to know that patients are entitled to the exam and the evidence collection regardless of whether they have made a police report. And this is a really important piece for all programs to be aware of. Federal VAWA statutes really are quite clear that we have to provide them the exam and the evidence re collection without requiring them to make a police report. So for some small jurisdictions, this can be a challenge when you think about what am I going to do with this evidence kit that I can't turn over to law enforcement because they haven't made a report. So many areas have worked with their law enforcement, have worked out systems to have Jane Doe kits, but somebody needs to be thinking about this in your area, making sure there is a mechanism for people to come in to have the exam and the evidence collection done, and oftentimes to spend some time thinking about whether they want to go forward with a legal case. And sometimes that can take a couple of months, but it really is a service to the patient if we can give them the amount of time they need, hold the evidence for them until they've made that decision. During the exam, we are doing a head-to-toe exam. We're looking for injuries. We're taking photographs. We're documenting all of the injuries. We're also swabbing for evidence. On most patients, we're going to do oral swabs, fingertip swabs, reference blood. We do external perineal vulvar swabs. We do internal vaginal swabs. And we, we do external and internal anal swabs, generally on all adult adolescent patients. And then, as the history dictates, we consider doing toxicology for drugs. We consider collecting trace evidence if they haven't changed their clothes, if there's debris on the skin or areas of the skin where there may be semen or saliva or some type of lubricant that we could swab, we'll collect those. We also do pubic hair combing looking for suspect pubic hairs. Rarely, when we do the evidence collection and the pelvic exam, are we doing a speculum exam. We don't need to use a speculum in order to collect the evidence and assess for injuries in most of the cases. And oftentimes, the use of a speculum really replicates the assault and some of the qualities of the assault. And that's not really what we want to do. We want to make the exam as easy as possible. So most of the time, you will not see a speculum used. We use a speculum when the patient has injuries that we cannot account for, that we need to assess further. If there's bleeding that we can't understand, we need to assess further. But in most of the patients, uh, we don't need to use a speculum. There was a question about whether or not um, we need to, whether the speculum is increases the evidence or the DNA possibilities, and the answer is no. Most studies don't really show that there's any greater evidence collection with the use of a speculum or not, so we choose not to do it. Um, there's a question about whether sweat can be collected for DNA. Um, at this point, not as we have not received word from our crime lab that they're doing a lot of sweat analysis. If I felt like a patient gave me a report that they were assaulted and the person was very sweaty and their sweat got, the assailant sweat got on the patient, I would probably collect it just as a matter of course to try to be complete. I can't guarantee it would yield anything, but I always figure it's better to collect more than less. The other question that was asked is how long is the rape kit held for the patient? And that is really a program-specific decision. Um, it kind of depends on what each program can do for storage. At Harborview, we are currently storing our kits for six months. Um, I think that that gives patients enough time to really make a decision. And the reality is most of the patients who are going to decide to make a report do so in the first couple of months. But we do store it for six months. But again, it's a decision that needs to be made by each program based on how much storage capacity they have and what they are able to provide for the patient. Now, there are some patient populations that we do offer some special considerations for that need some special considerations, and so I've kind of highlighted some of those here. The first one is any patient that has been strangled. Uh, patients who have been strangled really do need a detailed medical exam in addition to the forensic sexual assault exam. They need a medical provider to look at them, to possibly consider doing some imaging studies to look for any further injuries. Strangulations can cause injuries to the um, internal breathing, 
structures in the neck that can cause swelling in the musculature of the neck that can also cut off their airway. Some of that stuff can happen immediately. Some of it can happen up to 48 hours after a strangulation event, which is why we do suggest Similar to a concussed patient, we suggest that strangled patients be observed for the next 48 hours by someone to make sure that they're okay, that they're not having any additional challenges medically. And then ideally, if your program can support it, a follow-up visit in 48 hours after strangulation would be great in order to document injury progression. And this may be a place that the advocates can really play a role of touching base with the patients someone taking photographs. Injury is oftentimes an initial bruise that may occur immediately after strangulation may look much more pronounced in the next 48 hours. And someone being available to take those pictures can really help with the case. May not always, an emergency room really isn't the place for that, but an advocate may be able to help with that and at least connect them with law enforcement or somebody that can um, help do that. Um, strangulation also, the documentation of strangulation can be particularly relevant in domestic violence sexual assault cases. Uh, there's some new statutes in Washington that went into place in 2007 that made strangulation uh, assault increase the chargeability. So what was maybe once uh, considered a misdemeanor domestic violence charge can now be increased to a felony charge, and that can really assist in the legal case as well. So. The documentation of strangulation is very important, and we do um, some sort of particular questions around strangulation for all of those patients. So another group that really requires some very special consideration are elderly patients. Um, elderly patients, by nature of their complex medical issues that may arise in older age, they may be more susceptible to injuries that may need some follow-up, but you also have to think about what's happened in their life Elderly patients who may have been independent living prior to the assault, their family may decide that that's no longer an option for them. Their life may become very um, overturned. There are a lot of changes that are going to happen to them, and we need to think about how are we going to support them. Many of the patients, elderly patients who suffer an assault actually have a significant health decline in the six months post-assault. So what are we going to do to care for those patients? How are we going to think about what is the best safety option for them in discharge? So those, that's another population that, unfortunately, we need to take a little extra care with. And then the pregnant patient, again, another patient that needs a little extra care because the pregnant patient, unfortunately, is not just one patient. We are actually caring for two patients. There is the unborn baby that we need to think about. Uh, domestic violence in pregnancy is not uncommon, and it is can be a time of increasing violence. And so we need to think about the safety plan for that mother and that victim. We need to think about how we're going to keep them safe. We need to think about are there injuries that have occurred that may present a concern for the safety of the fetus, and how are we going to protect them? Most pregnant patients really also should be seen by a medical provider in addition to the sexual assault exam just to assure that their safety and they don't have any other medical needs, make sure the baby is okay and safe. So that's another group that we, we need to take particular care for. Developmentally delayed, definitely a high-risk group for abuse. And so how can we support that patient? How much do they understand about the exam that we're doing? Are they able to sign their own consents? Do they have somebody in position of power that can sign consents for them? These are all issues that need to be dealt with ahead of time and that we need to think about before we do the exam. We don't force the exam on anyone, so we want people to be sure to understand the exam, understand what we're doing. So educating the patient about why we're doing this exam, we need to know what is their developmental age? What are they able to understand? What are they able to consent to? How much teaching do we need to do for them? I think it's always really great and a good opportunity, even after sexual assault has occurred, to provide some safety and prevention education for some of these people who may not be as aware of what's going on or as aware of the fact that they can be more victimized. And then there are always safety concerns as well for developmentally delayed. In particular, what if it's a caregiver that is the one that's assaulted them? How are we going to keep them safe? What placement options do they have if they were assaulted in a group home or someplace like that that cares for them? So we need to look at all of those factors. <laughs>
The last sort of special group I do want to touch on is children. So not every emergency department and not every SANE program in the state is going to provide care for young children. Um, they don't all necessarily feel comfortable. It should be, and it would be ideal, that everyone could at least do an initial exam to look for acute injuries and document those. That's fairly simple to do, but when you're talking about looking at children and determining whether abuse has ever occurred, that really does require an exam by a specialist. Typically, each county does have a plan in place for who would do those exams. Um, and if, if all else fails, there are some resources in Western Washington, including Harborview, that could provide those exams for patients. But children do have a unique, some unique considerations. The interview is definitely different with children. We're not trying to interview them and ask them all the questions that we ask adults. There are some very specific courses in child interviewing that are taken by interviewers, and not everyone does those interviews, so we need to be cautious about how we're talking to children. The medications that we give children definitely can be different. We do not routinely give prophylactic medications to children. A child who presents or is found to have a sexually transmitted infection, that may very well be diagnostic for sexual assault, so we need to be taking measures to, number one, determine if that is a true infection. There's no false positive, so we always want to do two tests and then um, confirm that and then consider treating the, the infection after that. And then um, there's some differences in evidence collection. We don't typically do anything in the emergency department that's going to hurt the children. So we're not doing the blood. We're not often doing... Um, any of the swabs, like the anal swabs that may be somewhat uncomfortable to children if we don't have to. And there's a question about what I'm talking about. Children, children we typically refer to as either prepubertal or postpubertal, so roughly 12 and under we would consider children. Over 12 we would consider adolescents. But puberty is generally the marker at which we sort of switch from child to teen. That's how we would define it. Cheryl, any other things you want to touch on with these groups? I think it's important, uh, particularly with kids, go to your prosecutor, go to your law enforcement, because they most certainly have a plan in place and who they want to see children. And I think if you're going to be um, serving those communities, it's important to collaborate ahead of time to know what the process in the county is. Most counties do have a fairly well-defined um, process in Washington State. When we talk about um, the exam further, we really need to understand what normal anatomy is, and the nurses are trained extensively on anatomy and findings related to sexual assault. The lack of or the presence of findings really don't tell the whole story. So patients, I can think of many patients who have described a history of a sexual assault, and it's a horrific history. They were assaulted in a park, dragged through the flower bed, beaten, yet they show up and it can be normal to have very little or no findings. The same thing is true. I've heard patients describe a very minimal assault where there was no hitting and restraints and anything else, and yet they have lots of injuries. So the findings don't tell the whole story. The nurses that are trained to be sexual assault examiners really do play an advanced role because they're able to explain findings, they're able to help the patient understand their injuries, they're there to help the patient care for those injuries. We spend a lot of time talking about why it's normal to be normal in the findings. And actually the sexual assault nurse examiner spends time in the courtroom really becoming an educator for the defense attorney, the prosecutor, and ultimately the jury on why it's okay to be assaulted and have normal findings, which most of the time will be the case. What can be helpful, though, with the documentation and the history that Terry talked about at the beginning of the presentation is that that often helps put all the pieces together once we're able to do the exam. And remember, the sexual assault examiner, that is the person who is taking care of the crime scene, which is the patient's body. We may never be at the crime scene where the patient was assaulted, but we are at the crime scene of what happened to the patient's body. And so part of what we do is document so that the law enforcement and prosecutor can help put all those pieces together. 
it's very important that we help the patient understand. If I find an injury or a scrape or a bruise in the genitals, the patient's going to have a lot of questions about that. And so part of the role that the examiner plays is to help the patient to understand. So when we see genital injury, to give the reassurance that that injury is going to probably heal with no residual complications, it's going to heal very rapidly because that's how that part of the body is designed for healing. So we need to help patients really understand that. You know, Terry and I both see lots of teenagers. They really want to know, is anybody going to know what happened to me, and am I going to be normal like all my friends? And we can help with that by helping explain how the body works and what we saw. So I think it's very important when we talk about the findings that we help patients renormalize again, and we make sure that we feel comfortable to answer all those questions. Sometimes the injuries are going to be horrific to look at. We also need to be able to address that as well. And I think this is a critical time for the examiner and the advocate to work side by side because I want to remain in that objective environment. And oftentimes the genital exam is really the most traumatic piece for the patient. Think about what has happened to them and the exam can feel like an assault all over again. So that's why I think that collaboration between the, the SANE nurse and the um, advocate is just critical. Now, I want to talk next about the SANE and the legal roles. The SANE nurse may be called to testify in court, and statistically only about 10% of cases that we collect evidence on will ever make it to the court environment, and that's really determined by the prosecutor. Of those 10% that actually make it into the legal realm, many of those will settle before any trial proceedings. The same is really there to testify to what was seen, what was found, what was collected, and what was observed. Terry mentioned that we do near verbatim documentation, and that's where we're really trying to collect the patient's statements as close to what they said in quotes so that those things can be in the legal record for the examination. Sometimes the same nurse will be a fact witness. Yes, I was there on October 5th. Yes, I saw Sally Smith. And yes, I collected that evidence. And yes, these are my findings. As a fact witness, we may be asked to get up and draw a picture and talk about the injuries. We may talk about why the body works a certain way, what is normal for the genitals. So we may have a lot of things we're testifying to fact. Sometimes the nurse will be asked to be an expert and give expert testimony. You know, what in my experience, what is my opinion related to that type of an injury? And that's a different kind of testimony. If that kind of testimony is required of the nurse, they will be qualified as an expert first and allowed to give that kind of testimony. We teach the nurses not to venture out in realms that they don't know about or they're not comfortable. So for example, Terry and I would never be testifying about blood spatter marks because that's not our area of expertise. But if Terry and I were asked in our experience during normal intercourse, do we see vaginal lacerations? We could say in our experience of normal patients, no, we don't see, typically don't see vaginal lacerations. So the nurses are really trained about fact and expert testimony. The same nurse plays many roles during the exam. We're a crisis intervention worker. We're a prophylactic medication giver. We're there to comfort the patient. We're there to help the patient understand the exam. We're there collecting forensic evidence. Each of the roles, though, are collaborative. We collaborate with the patient first and foremost. We're collaborating with the advocate, and we're collaborating with the rest of the healthcare team and with law enforcement and the prosecutor. So there's many, many roles that the same nurse is doing that is a very objective part of the examination. The facts can tell the same, the same a story. So when I hear that the patient was assaulted in a certain position and I find injuries in a particular area, it certainly can tell me a lot about the story because we've had the opportunity to do hundreds upon hundreds of exams. The biggest role I feel in the court situation is I really put on the hat of an educator. 
most jurors don't really know a lot about their bodies, nor do they know a lot about their genitals, and they don't know a lot about sexual assault. So it's important that, you know, the SANE nurse have that educator role. We also often are going to get up and diagram the injury. So our nurses are trained to get up and diagram the body, diagram a traumagram, a, a genital traumagram. So we spend a lot of time in the trainings. Any of you who've got to sit through the training, they actually have to get up and draw a vagina, a penis, and a bottom. And um, we make that part of the training because we want them to be comfortable with that. One of the things I just want to add about the SANES and the legal role, for any of the law enforcement officers that may be listening, um, you probably are aware of a ruling state versus Hurtado. But basically, the sexual assault nurses, when they are doing an interview of the patient, are going to ask law enforcement to step out of the room. If the sexual assault nurse is interviewing a patient with law enforcement present, then the nurse is not going to be allowed to come in and provide testimony, a medical hearsay testimony in court, because it's going to be looked upon as they're doing an interview for law enforcement. So I don't want law enforcement to be offended or upset if the nurse is asking them to step out. They're asking them to step out so that if this case goes to court, the nurse can come in and present what the patient said to them and get evidence and testimony as well. So it's just trying to work through that new legal requirement in the state versus Hurtado case. So moving on to the talk about how we would wrap up with patients, the first thing we want to do is provide some post-assault medications, and I'd outline for you our typical regimen. So we're currently giving a gram of azithromycin to protect patients from getting chlamydia. We're giving a 250 milligram injection of ceftriaxone to protect against gonorrhea. We're giving two grams of metronidazole to protect against trichomonas. We can either give Plan B or also there's a new formulation, Ella, that provides pregnancy prevention. And then we also have HIV prophylaxis, and we're currently using Truvada and Raltegravir. All of these medications we're giving without ever providing STD testing for the patients. We don't do testing at the time of the exam because that's going to tell us whether or not they have an STD from about two to three weeks prior. It's not going to tell us if the assailant in this sexual assault gave them a sexually transmitted infection. So rather than testing and then having to relocate patients a few days later to determine if they actually need medications, we just simply provide the same medication we would give if they had an infection. And then the patients don't have to worry about it at all. That piece is taken off of their, of their worry list. HIV prophylaxis, we do, do, we do sort of look and see what is the risk. So most people don't know their assailant, don't know the risk involved. They're not able to tell us if the assailant is HIV positive or is an IV drug user. So we sort of have to do some guessing. The truth is there aren't really a lot of, there aren't any studies out there about HIV prophylaxis and sexual assault and what's the true risk. And there's not ever going to be studies because you can't do a study where you sexually assault someone by an HIV positive person or not HIV positive person simply to find out what we should be doing. So we make an educated guess based on the HIV incidents in the area, based on what's happened in the assault. Were there genital injuries? That absolutely increases a person's risk for, for HIV, so we'd want to be sure to prophylax those people. Was there an anal assault? That also increases a person's risk for HIV, so we would put them in a higher risk category. But ultimately, any patient who is so worried about HIV that they're going to go home from our exam and not be able to sleep for days or weeks, if what would make them feel best is to have those medications, we will provide those medications. In the past, those medications, uh, Crime Victims' Compensation only paid for three days' worth of those medications, and uh, both the medications need to be taken for 28 days. And they cost roughly $3,000 for a 28-day course. Uh, just recently in the last year, uh, Crime Victims' Compensation is now paying for the full 28-day course of the medications. So. We, shouldn't, we should no longer have to worry about or have a conversation with patients about the cost of the medication. It is paid for by crime victims' compensation, and we'll talk a little bit about that CVC piece in just a few more slides. Um, the current HIV prophylaxis, 
that we are using at Harborview on our HIV guidelines have finally now been updated and should be on the HCSAS website within the next week or two. So if you have questions about what medications to provide or how to do a risk assessment, those can be found at www.hcsats.org. They'll be right there on the front page for anyone that needs to use them. I just want to mention, Terry, about Plan B pregnancy emergency contraception. I think it's important for everyone, including the advocates, to be able to advocate for the patient. By law, that has to be offered to the patient who's been assaulted. It doesn't matter if they're in a hospital that has a religious background, such as a Catholic hospital. That has to be offered to the patient. So somebody needs to be speaking up if that's not being done and the patient wants that. So that's a very important piece. And not only does it have to be offered, the actual pills need to be given to the patient. It is not acceptable anywhere in the state for any hospital to simply write a prescription and tell the patient to go to a pharmacy. You actually have to provide the pills in the emergency department if you are providing sexual assault care. So that is, I'm glad you mentioned that, Cheryl. That's a really important point that needs to be made. Okay, so the next piece that we do when we're wrapping up with the patient is to do some safety planning. Where's the patient going to go when they leave this hospital? And are they going to be safe? Some of that depends largely on the relationship between the victim and the offender. Does the offender live in the home? Is this a domestic violence situation? That's the case that we need to look really closely at how we're going to protect the patient. Is it a stranger rape? But the patient has a lot of fears that this patient, that this offender has already come to their home. They already know where they live, so now they're more afraid. Some programs, many programs actually can offer a hotel for a night or something to keep the patient safe. So we need to look at where are they going. And not only the patient, but do they have children in the home? Do they have other family members in the home? Who all do we need to protect as we are protecting this patient? When we think about protecting them, not only from any further physical harm, but protecting them in their mental health as well. Do they have support people in place that they can talk to? Do they have someone that's going to be with them at the time that they need them most? Or do we need to try to hook them up immediately with some sort of counseling resources? Every county has a um, sexual assault advocacy program. They can help direct people to counseling resources afterwards. After an assault, the advocates play a key role in that in helping connect them with those resources. So sort of thinking about what are all the things that they may need when they leave your facility and has all that been sort of wrapped up and taken care of. And then are, are they making a police report? Do they know how to make a police report? Can we have the police come to the hospital and make the report there? Or does the patient want to go home and do it on another time and we can give them the resources to help that, help facilitate sort of that that uh, police reporting. If there are children or teens involved, then a CPS report may need to be made. If they're elderly, it may need to be an adult protective services report. So we need to think about all the reporting that we need to do and how can we sort of safely get that patient discharged from our facility. We shouldn't be rushing that discharge. We should really be taking the time to make sure we're covering everything that that patient needs. The next thing we really need to do before we send them out is Talk to them about what happened. Cheryl talked to you a little bit about that already, but explain what we found. Explain what we found in the exam and explain what that means. Is there a place that can provide follow-up medical care? Most of the sexual assault programs don't have a follow-up clinic associated with them. So if you don't have a follow-up clinic in your area, who can you direct patients to go to? Do they have a primary care doctor that can help them? Is Planned Parenthood a resource in your community that would be willing to provide some follow-up services? So making some connections in your community to find out who wants to take these patients on. People that definitely need follow-up medical care are anybody that was started on HIV prophylactic medications. Midway through treatment, they should be having some lab work checked to make sure that they're not having any side effects or difficult complications from the medications. Someone should be talk a medical provider should be talking to them about are they tolerating the medications? Do they need to change their medications for any reason? So we do need to identify someone that can follow those patients. 
it can be their primary care provider. It might be an infectious disease specialist or an internal medicine specialist in your area, but someone that can help the patient. So we need to definitely be sure that we can, we can deal with that. And then we should have an understanding, and we do typically talk to patients about what is the next step in the legal process. So what's going to happen to the evidence? We let them know that the evidence, is, if they've made a report, it's going to be transferred to law enforcement, and they're going to send it to the crime lab for analyzing. If they haven't made a report, who's going to keep the, medication, the evidence, and how long will it be kept, and how will the decision be made whether or not it's ever transferred to the police? So we try to go over all of that with them. We let them know what to expect from law enforcement. So typically, after an initial report is made, a detective will want to contact the patient and have a more lengthy interview with the patient. So it's helpful if we can help the patients understand that process and know what to expect. And then it's always, always important to let them know that there is legal advocacy out there for them, and I think legal advocacy is really critical. Our legal system is very complex, and as someone who has gone to court and testified myself, I still don't even understand all of it all the time. So I think that having a legal advocate that can be a point of contact to communicate between law enforcement and the patient, to explain to the patient the status of their case and what's going on is really important. So we try to make sure that they understand all of those resources that are available. Carrie, there was a question related to uh, by law, the treatments must be given at the time of the exam, and I've answered to the group, yes, the Plan B and the uh, STI, STD prophylaxis, because they're just one-time doses, are given right there where the patient presents, usually in the emergency department. And then the question, Terry, is what about the HIV prophylaxis? I know in our healthcare system, we give the patient three days' worth and arrange follow-up care uh, in our community with our disease uh, person, our disease prophylaxis person at the hospital, but what, what's your experience with the HIV prophylaxis? So what we're currently doing at Harborview with HIV prophylaxis is we are providing five days worth of the medications. And we picked five just because of the weekend situation. So after five days, they have follow-up at our Madison Clinic. So, again, HIV experts will follow them. But then they go back to Madison Clinic to get the additional 28 days worth of medication. And I think it's a system that needs to be sort of worked out and figured out with some other provider. I know there are places that will provide prescribe the full 28-day course, and my only concern is that the patient is then not getting a, an exa a, a follow-up visit to make sure that there's no complications from the medications that they're tolerating. I think it's, they really do need to have some sort of follow-up. And if you only give them five days' worth, that sort of gives them sort of the reason to go to follow-up so that they can then get the remaining 28-day course of medications. We really emphasize to the nurses during the training that they must become the community expert for what next for the patient. So what are all the referral sources? Where do the patients go for each of these things? And that that is clearly articulated both verbally and in writing with the patient. We do not want the patient leaving us wondering what next. That's right. And that's why, you know, the last slide on wrapping up again, just highlighting the follow-up recommendations that we want the patient to have. And in writing, but also spoken to them. Um, you know, the truth is that so many patients in the emergency room in that moment right after an assault aren't going to retain all of the information, and so having it written down and having a phone number available that they can call because they didn't hear or couldn't hear or were too overwhelmed to understand the directions we gave them, which is totally normal, but to give them a number they can call to make so they know exactly what, what follow-up needs they have. Um, Again, we talked about a follow-up medical exam if possible, in particular for patients who may have been strangled or have some extensive injuries. It has been really helpful to me to be able to see patients about a week after an assault and document progression of injuries or additional injuries that may have occurred after the assault exam. Sometimes patients' injuries don't show up for a couple of days, and so to even simply to be able to talk to a patient and say, did you notice any new injuries and what were they, that can go, then go back into their legal record. Assess for the HIV PEP to see if they're getting follow-up for that. Absolutely have some conversation with them about counseling resources. We at Harborview are certainly very strong advocates for evidence-based counseling, like trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive processing therapies. 
So all of the um, sexual assault programs in the various counties know about their resources and know um, what's available, just making sure that as, as nurses we too are aware of what are the resources in our area and how can we connect patients up to that. Um, and I talked again about referral for legal advocacy, but I'm a huge supporter of that. And then we also want to provide them with information about crime victims compensation. I'm going to move to the next slide so that everybody can be aware of what crime victims compensation is. It is the program in our state that pays for the sexual assault exams. If a patient is assaulted in the state of Washington, the initial exam and evidence collection and all of the medications related to the sexual assault exam are paid by Washington State Crime Victims Compensation, and the, no hospital should be sending a bill to the patient for these services. If a patient has injuries in addition to needing a sexual assault exam, so let's say they broke their arm, the cost of caring for the broken arm would first be billed to the patient's insurance. But the, co the cost of the evidence exam, and SANE exam, and the SANE medications that we provide should not be billed. So sometimes there will be bills for certain services, but for the sexual assault exam, evidentiary exam, there's no bill for that. If a patient is assaulted in another state, which does happen, so they're assaulted in Oregon or they're assaulted in Idaho, it is a challenge for most hospitals in Washington because we don't really have a mechanism set up to bill other states' crime victims' compensation. So typically what does happen is that the patient is billed for the exam and then the patient can send that bill to the state crime victims' compensation in which the, state, the crime occurred and get reimbursed for it. It's not the ideal situation, but that is typically what happens. All states in the United States are required to pay for the initial exam without having a reporting requirement. That's a new VAWA regulation. So it doesn't matter what state they were assaulted in. If they did not make the sexual, did not make a police report, they should still be able to get that exam free of charge. Now, one thing I will say is that most of the hospitals that do sexual assault exams are very clear on how to bill crime victims or semi-clear. They can at least know how to figure it out. But if you're talking about private doctor's offices, and certainly if you're talking about private pharmacies like your Walgreens or your Bartels, whatever pharmacy down the street, they're not going to know how to bill crime victims' compensation, and they're not going to bill crime victims' compensation. So if you are handing patients a prescription to take to an outside pharmacy, they are going to end up having to pay for those prescription, those medications out of pocket. Most of them are not very expensive. However, the HIV medications are, and like I told you, it's $3,000 for a 28-day course of those medications, which most patients cannot afford to pay. So ideally, all of the medications and all of the treatment that is needed for the sexual assault should happen at the hospital that the exam has occurred in. That way, we can be sure that the patient is not going to be getting billed. Just something to think about as we're sending patients out to encourage them to get their exams done or get their medications done at the hospital that the exam was done, just to ease the, their mind about it. They can certainly go back to crime victims and ask for um, some help in paying the bills, but it's easier to do it um, ahead of time. So Sorry, there's a question related to crime victims is for sexual assault patients only, that evidentiary exam, and what about DV, domestic violence victims? So. Currently, the law supports sexual assault victims. If a, if a domestic violence victim shows up in an emergency department and is making a police report and cooperating with law enforcement and the prosecutor's office, then there is an opportunity for them to work with crime victims on a separate um, area for some compensation. But that is required that they are making a police report and working with law enforcement and the prosecutor's office. Um, there is a mechanism in most hospitals to still get that patient the crime victim's form, but they are not guaranteed um, any reimbursement. It's a completely separate part of crime victims. Yeah, the distinction there is if between the SA and the DB is that the SA patient does not need to apply for or fill out any CVC paperwork in order for those exam costs to be covered. The hospital should be handling that directly for a DV survivor to request um, reimbursement for some costs incurred as a result um, of an assault, 
as Cheryl was saying, then they are the ones that are going to be going through that process with CDC. There was one other question, um, which I think is a great question, which is how does HIV prophylaxis work? What does it do? So the medications that we're giving, the HIV prophylactic medications, are antiretroviral medications. And these are medications that have been studied primarily in HIV uh, positive or high risk um, people, which is generally men who have sex with men, um, and, but also has been studied in um, pregnant women, so babies born to pregnant women. And essentially, these are the same as a lot of the medications that people who are HIV positive take, but in taking the medication, it prevents the replication of the HIV virus. So it prevents the patients from actually acquiring the HIV virus. It keeps them protected from it in similar ways, but the azithromycin protects people from getting chlamydia in the first place. It sort of blocks that from happening. So that's kind of how the HIV medications work. The two medications that we're using have a lot less side effects than some of the previous medications. So some programs may still be using Calitro, which can cause a lot of nausea and vomiting, some diarrhea. The Reltegravir is one that we've updated because the side effects and the medication interactions is a little bit less. So I hope that answers that, um, that one question about HIV. We're going to move on to um, our last slide. Cheryl, you want to touch on that? Yes, I do, absolutely. So when we talk about the collaborative roles of the SANE and the advocate, I have from the beginning over the last two decades felt very strong about the collaborative role. We each play a role. We have an overlap of our roles, but that is critical for the patient. And so in the trainings, we absolutely ask that the hospital set up their guidelines to call the SANE and the advocate at the same time. And one of the counties that I worked in and actually uh, spearheaded starting the sexual assault program for that community, we actually looked at 100 of our patients retrospectively. We, we surveyed them and said, you know, we asked questions about, you know, did you like having an advocate at the bedside? What worked really well? And 99% of those patients absolutely felt that that role was absolutely critical for them to have at the bedside. The one patient in the study who did not have an advocate, her response was this, I felt really bad getting two people up in the middle of the night to come in and help care for me, so I just went with the nurse because I didn't want to bother anyone else. So I think it's just very important that we be at the bedside together. And the process at the bedside, we need to understand these, each other's roles. When Terry and I do these core trainings, we always have an advocate come in and talk with the nurses about their role. It's important that the advocate come in and explain their role to the patient. If the patient chooses not to have somebody extra at the bedside, that's completely the patient's right. But I think that the advocate needs to come and explain their role and what services that they can provide to the patient at the bedside side and going forward. And those of you who are on this presentation that are not advocates, I want to have you hear me say it is the patient's legal right to have an advocate present. And the, truly the advocate is the person who can walk through each of the legal steps with the patient. I won't sit in with the patient during a defense interview. I may not even be present through the whole court proceedings. So I think it's important that we get that person at the bedside for the, to protect the patient's rights. I think the same nurse will have a lot of preparatory steps, and I think it's important for the advocate to understand all of our equipment, what are our exam, what's in the evidence collection box, because the patient may have questions, and I'm perfectly comfortable with the advocate jumping in and saying, well, they're going to swab your mouth now, and that's important because. So advocates that are sitting in, this morning for this WebEx, I think it's important for you to feel like you can attend one of our trainings as well. We always welcome that attendance, and you can find that information for the next upcoming class on the HICSAT website, which I think uh, was put in a few minutes ago to the chat box. I think the other piece with that is that the, um, the patient is already going to be anxious and nervous, so that one support person at the bedside who can continually help put the patient at ease is a great role. I do want to talk, advocates, that there is 
of vicarious victimization that can happen at the bedside to you. And it's important that you get the support that you need and that you feel that you can use the same as a support too. When we experience another person's trauma, that's called vicarious victimization. And that can be very, very undoing for a person if you go and sit at the bedside over and over and over and you hear one rape story after the next. So it's important that you set up your support. The collaboration is not limited to just the exam room, though. If an advocate has questions, please follow up with the SANE nurse. Please call, make connections, find out what it is you need to know. It's okay to contact us after the exam to understand what happened, to seek meeting and clarification. You might even be calling us on behalf of the patient. Maybe that patient doesn't remember what we talked about for injuries, and you want to call us and ask, we want you to do that. Let's make sure that we do that, though, outside the patient's presence. We don't want to ask questions about process and findings in front of the patient if it's going to be unduly stressful for the patient. We all have the same goal, and that's to serve the, the survivor, the victim, of the sexual assault. And we need to figure out how we can do that collaboratively. When I started doing this work 20 years ago, I was amazed at how many times the physician got to say that there was no advocate in the um, room with the patient. And I think that really came from ignorance. They didn't understand that that was the patient's right. So I've really strived that we have that collaborative bedside effort for the patient. Terry, did you want to add anything about the SANE and the advocate role? I know you guys do it a little bit different at Harborview. Right. So in King County, we have not had medical advocacy um, available to us for quite a long time. There, that's just not something that's been funded anywhere in the county. So Harbor View, um, way back when we started the same program, developed um, a role with our social workers in our emergency room who all do take the 40-hour um, advocacy training, and they provide that advocacy for our same nurses. Um, one of their roles could be the role of the advocate, could also be the role of the SANE, though, is to really, prior to any exam, prior to anything happening, doing a consent with the patient, helping them understand their rights, getting them to sign off on what they want or don't want, um, making sure that they're aware of everything that's going to happen in that exam. And that's an important piece to have done ahead of time. There are patients that present to our emergency department who meet with our social worker. The social worker goes over all of the exam, what the SANE is going to do, and the patient may decide that that's not what they want to have happen tonight, and that's okay. And that's a role that the advocate can fill. Um, you know, again, like Cheryl said, we're both, both the advocates and the SANEs are working for the same cause. We are there to support a patient. We are there to help a patient get through a difficult time to make this moment a little easier to try to meet their needs in the emergency department. And we may do it slightly differently, but we really are all there on the same page and we really are trying to um, trying to definitely meet their needs. I think that um, Cheryl's point about calling the advocate right away is a really good point. We, I think that that uh, sort of um, example of the patient who didn't have an advocate isn't a great example. Our patients, even though they've had a horrible, horrible experience, at the root of it, they are all, what I have found, still very kind and considerate people who don't want to bother anybody and who for some reason don't feel like they're justified in bothering people. And so I think we do need to take that off of patients and we need to let the patients have all the resources available to them. So bring everyone in. And if, by the, if when the advocate comes, the patient says, I don't care for that or I don't need that, that's okay. But let them have the option to decline it when someone is there. There are some programs around that are not calling advocates right away, that same nurses are arriving at the hospital and then they're waiting for the advocates, and that's really not helpful to the patient. I don't think we should have the patient sitting in an emergency room any longer than they need to. The exam already takes quite a bit of time, and if we're having them wait an hour or two hours for a nurse and an advocate to arrive, that's not really supporting a patient in the best way that we can. So if there's a way that the two programs can come together, make a decision about how to really get both people in there as quickly as possible, that would be definitely very ideal. Terry, maybe I can try to, I see a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to try to Great. paint a small scenario. If you've come to our trainings, 
When you hear me lecture, you know that it's the world according to Cheryl Graff. And in Cheryl Graff's world, this is how I think it works best. The patient presents to the emergency department. They most certainly talk to a registration person and a triage nurse. It is identified that the patient is a sexual assault patient. At that time, the hospital and advocates, if your community is not doing this, put it on your to-do list to follow up and meet with the ER directors. The patient is identified as an SA patient, and then two phone calls are made. The sexual assault nurse is asked to come in, and at the same time, the advocate is asked to come in. They both arrive around the same time, and they meet the patient together. They both describe the services that can be provided, and then they proceed with the examination, starting with the history. That is the ideal situation. And if we can get closer to that in our communities, I think we're providing the best service for the patient. The informed consent is really a process that is unfolding throughout the course of the exam. There's an informed consent question. We're asking the patient about what they would like for us to do after we've explained. So there are different pieces that they're going to consent for. They may be consenting for photography. They're consenting for the exam. They may be consenting for medications. So we're giving an overview of the patient, the history is guiding what we're going to recommend, and then the patient will consent. And sometimes that may change along the way. I may say to Terry, go ahead, take some photos, and then it's okay for me to change my mind and say, no, you're not taking any photos, and I take away that piece of the consent for the exam. So I hope that answers the consent question.